Hello, everybody. My name is Marcelo Cabrol. I manage uh, the social sector departments of the IDB. I don't know if the department manages me or I manage the department, but that's a conversation <laughs> for after for the wine. Um, I'm super happy to be here. Uh, I think that uh, this is uh, innovation in education is uh, a really a topic that we should pay and we should be paying more attention. Uh, I have five minutes allotted to do uh, introductory remarks. I'm not going to take five minutes. I'm not going to take any minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you how many of you actually has, have the, the, the agenda for today. Do you have it with you? OK. If you want the long version of uh, the bios of uh, this panel that we have here, you can read it there. OK? <laughs> uh, in the meantime, and to uh, take advantage of the time, I'm going to ask my fellow panelists here to introduce themselves in a very short way. And the agreement that we have is that it's going to be short enough to tell you who they are, a highlight, and what do, what is their occupation or, or trouble today, OK? And then we're going to go directly to questions. And it's going to be a little bit different because we're going to stop at the middle of the panel for questions from the audience, OK? So I'm not going to let you get to 445 and then ask questions, I'm going to ask you to make questions before, OK? This is a great opportunity for you to interact directly with the panelists. So I'm going to start from the right to the left. And this is not a, an ideological preference. This is just the way we decided <laughs> that we would do it. Yeah, first of all, thanks for the invitation. My name is Sako Tuominen, coming from Finland. Uh, instead of. I'm, I'm going to break the rules immediately, but that's kind of like the essence, <laughs> of, essence of innovating things as any, anyhow. So, so being here, following the discussions all day, I'm again, once more, I'm amazed. The things we heard from Senegal, from Paraguay, Uruguay, from Colombia, uh, from South Korea and so on, amazing things. And I'd say that practically every teacher, every education expert in Finland would love those. Hmm. Beautiful ideas and so on. If I would do a test, which one of them has heard of any of these innovations ever, I'd say no one. And that's the key problem in the world of education. No one knows about the things that are happening in other countries. And that's the mission we have at 100. We want to make the beautiful work that is happening in classrooms visible. We are identifying great education innovations. We are packaging them and we are promoting them. We've gone through roughly about 1,700 innovations from 160 countries. And, and, and that's, con that's the track. We want to be the world's leading expert on this area by 2020. And you feel that people, are, they are paying attention? Um, that, uh, pe people are paying attention, but it's, it's early days. So it's, it's not only about kind of like, it's, it's not only about packaging, it's <coughs> about doing hard work, making people excited, telling success stories, being out there, discussing with the teachers, mm understanding the obstacles and so on and so on. It, it's a long process, but it's fascinating. Thank you. We'll go over to that. David. My name is David Istens. Uh, for a number of years, I was for many years at the OECD. For a number of years, I headed a project called Innovative Learning Environments at the OECD. I left there uh, halfway through last year and um, finished then a report on pedagogy with uh, a young colleague at the OECD. I'm delighted to say that I've become uh, a non-resident senior fellow here at Brookings. Uh, and uh, Rebecca mentioned this morning there's work going on on teaching and learning, and I will be engaging more and more in that work. D David, are institutions such as the OECD or the IDB relevant in the discussion about innovation and education? I think they are, actually. I think the uh, OECD, I can talk about the uh, OECD better than some of the other institutions. Uh, the fact that they, there's an ear to a whole variety of stakeholders, including governments, mm -hmm. um, gives, I think, a wonderful opportunity for presenting particular ideas, um, a, a framing, legitimizing questions about innovation that in some political contexts would be hard to do. And the fact that you operate in an international context takes you one step removed from the day-to-day -day political um, confrontations and allows you a certain freedom, which I think is a freedom which I was delighted to indulge in when I was at OECD and from now on in Brookings. Thank you, David. Anna. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Anna. I'm from Brazil. 
and I've been trying to transform schools since I was a student. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm the director for a nonprofit whose mission is to inspire innovations to improve the quality of education in Brazil. Uh, we have the uh, most known websites that covers like uh, innovations in education in the country. We also foster innovations, you know, new solutions, especially for middle and high school students. And uh, we are now very much into listening to the students and uh, trying to learn from them what uh, the innovations must be, how to change schools to really uh, make it more meaningful to them. When I saw the map that Rebecca showed us this morning, Brazil was dark blue. Or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. almost dark blue. Why? Oh, we are very creative. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't mean that we are really changing the whole system, <laughs> but we have a lot of, uh, uh, I, I would say, almost isolated initiatives. They are very, very interesting, uh, which uh, gives us a lot of things to, to uh, publicize in our website. Uh, but uh, still, uh, when it comes to regular public schools, so we, uh, uh, you know, we have a long way to go in order to really make those uh, uh, isolated innovations some, something more uh, systemic uh, and sustainable. So creative, but not necessarily sustainable just yet. Exactly. All right. Gina. Thanks. Hi, I'm Gina Lagomarsino. I'm the CEO of Results for Development. Our mission is to support the change agents in low and middle income countries who are working to build strong and sustainable health and education systems. Um, and when we say change agents, we're talking about government leaders, but also innovators like the people in this room, um, many of the folks here, as well as civil society leaders. And we manage something called the Center for Education Innovations, which profiles about 800 different education innovations around the world in over 100 countries. We have a sister program in health that's similar. Um, so I think that's the reason I got invited to this panel, uh, because we're working on that. My personal background is actually in the health sector, so I'm feeling a bit daunted to be on this panel of education experts. Um, my colleague, Molly Eberhardt, was originally invited to be here. She's one of our directors in education, but she's about to have a baby any day now, so she is not here, and I'm here instead. You get me? We, we are super happy to have you here, and we might learn something for sure from, from health anyways. Uh, is anybody listening to your findings? I mean, going back to the first uh, uh, provocation that we heard. Is I mean, anyone listening yeah, to Yeah, I mean, you have 800 people there that are talking. Is it, well, you know? people are coming and looking and, and getting information. I think the challenge is to try to really better understand which innovations are working well and to try to synthesize um, the findings across those 800 innovators to see if there's some similarities across the programs. We look to see if we can find active ingredients that are at work in multiple innovations and then try to synthesize those and share those with would-be innovators mm -hmm. because I think that's part of the goal is both to support specific innovators to scale up their programs, but then also to help others around the world, whether they're government leaders who want to transform their systems or other private innovators to actually see what works. Excellent. Thank you, Gina. Mm -hmm. Last but not least. Yes, uh, hello. Oh, thank you, first of all, for the invitation uh, for being here. My name is Javier Gonzalez. Um, and my main interest actually has to do with one of the main issues in Latin America, which is inequality. Uh, and we're quite a failing society in that sense. Uh, I really believe, um, unfortunately, we still, well, actually, we still are the most unequal uh, region in the world. And, and this due mainly to very unfair institutions. Um, and therefore, we have to really innovate in the way we create these institutions, these rules of the game that we play as, as, as individuals in society. Um, so that's why I started my, my academic life, I mean my professional life actually in the government. I, I worked in the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Finance. Then I moved into academia, uh, where I'm still affiliated to the University of Cambridge where I teach actually uh, political economy and institutions. And then uh, I came into SUMA, which I'm right now I'm the director of SUMA, which is an institution which maybe I could summarize as trying to mobilize aliens to action. Uh, uh, basically, is how do we use the knowledge that we have to really change society? And, and therefore, we have a very broad definition of innovation mm -hmm. uh, that goes beyond projects, beyond intervention, is really trying to reimagine uh, the way we actually, well, wow. design our institutions as well. 
uh, not only formal institutions, but also social institutions through education. Uh, so so it's a, I think we are, it's a powerful uh, message in terms of, of also equalizing, basically, the way we treat each other in Latin America. So how would, you treat, how would you treat innovation that is not proven? Uh, well, actually, th that's a, 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 a very good debate. In, in SUMA, uh, and, and we're just talking about that, uh, we have created a map of innovation, which is a complement to what other P uh, maps are doing very well, actually, which is actually detecting what's out there. And Gradate 21st, for example, uh, has done a great job in that sense. What we're trying to contribute is another layer, mm -hmm. which basically is trying to say, OK, some are very promising uh, uh, innovations. But we're very interested also in saying which of those actually really work. Because it's an ethical issue here, which has to do with the fact that governments have to, I mean, if they really adopt an innovation, mm -hmm. they're actually putting a lot of money, public money, into it. So we really have to be very careful in what kind of innovations we really promote and, 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 and say, I mean, and, and publish in a way. Mm -hmm. Because basically, if not, there's a risk that when you publish something, then governments tend to think, or even civil society, will tend to think that you're actually backing up that innovation and we're not really sure. So I think you have to do both. You have to be constantly looking out you know, okay. in the field to detect the new things that are okay. happening. Can I hear the, um, the rest of the panel in that question, particularly how do you treat innovation that is not precisely proven? Go ahead. Uh, and, well, I, I think that in that case, it's not really an innovation. Okay. Because it, for me, I've been working with innovation all my life and I've been teaching, teaching innovation. And there's kind of like various ways to define what innovation is. Mm -hmm. If you ask me, I think first of all, it has to be innovative, which means that it, it has to prove something new within the context. So that's the first one, which is obvious. Then the second one is that it has to work. It has to be impactful because otherwise it's an idea. So idea, and then once you get get the feeling that actually it is working, there's some kind of impact impact analysis, then it's innovation. But not even that is enough. It also has to be scalable. So for me, innovation is a great idea that has proven to be working and that, that has potential to work in other places. Hmm. And those three are the, the key criteria we are using at 100. So every innovation we are picking is new, it's working, and it has potential to work in other places. Otherwise, we wouldn't select that one. So you told us we should disagree Absolutely. a little bit. <laughs> so I would say that it is, I, I agree with you that we need to focus on proving whether innovations work. But in the process, most innovations do start out as an idea. Most of them of need to be tweaked and improved upon in practice to actually get them to work. And of course, in different contexts, um, they need to be developed again often. Of um, and so I think one of the things we do is we use an adaptive learning methodology. We're supporting a number of the different <coughs> implementers that we profile to help them take a really good idea and then test the different components or active ingredients of that idea in practice. Maybe even test multiple different mechanisms <laughs> to see which one works for best rapidly and then enable them to uh, change that innovation, to, to switch the program design, switch the way they're implementing it so that over time it can actually be more um, impactful. And so I think it's important to do that kind of implementation research alongside broader impact evaluation in order to ensure that innovation I'll give you, I'll give you 30 I, seconds yeah, to uh, review that. I, in a way, I, I fully agree, but, but this, about the new ideas, roughly about 80% of the new ideas don't work. Okay. And that's why innovations are the ideas that did work. And know. once you have an innovation, it's an ongoing process, so you are improving, developing every innovation endlessly. But innovations for me are ideas that Understood. work. Understood. Understood. Yeah. How you? Yeah. I go so to I, I totally agree. Moment. I think the, the innovations actually actions are actually work. They the innovate and they work. But also, it's interesting to see when we look at innovations, the underlying methodologies that, that underlie. I mean, if you look at the, the very good uh, uh, report that the, the, the Brookings Institution actually just published, on like, can we leapfrog? And you look at the innovations that are basically they're pack packaging a lot of practices that, for example, with the EF, we have been working on basically which practices work. So if you take all these different programs, interventions, they have an underlying, for example, practice that have to do with feedback, mm. metacognition, peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning, etc. So it's very interesting that in some cases, you could think of maybe programs that haven't been tested yet, but the underlying 
practices actually have been tested. So there's a, it's a, 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 there's a complexity here that, that I think we, we should be aware certainly, of. Certainly, certainly. Anna, I, I saw we, you first. We I, also see, I, see that I saw David, so David, you're going next, okay? I promise. It's all right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm facing uh, that. <laughs> we are also a little bit more flexible on that. Uh -huh. uh, for us, uh, for instance, we want to explore what's going on, even if it's not proven yet. Uh, but uh, to really understand uh, what type of problems are really uh, relevant, uh, priorities. Is it, is it ethical if you do that with public money? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not saying that uh, innovation I, I must be done with public asking. money in the beginning. Right, and actually, what we heard from Rebecca is that the nonprofits are actually innovating uh, more than uh, the public sector. But uh, you know, as a, as a spotter, like you were as, uh, calling us, <laughs> we like to explore what's going on uh, and uh, what type of uh, promising solutions are there for the relevant problems that we are facing and try to support them as well. So it's not only about uh, waiting for those uh, you know, promises to become uh, proven uh, practices, best practices, but really trying to help them become those, uh, those innovations. Thank you. Uh, so. That's very helpful. Yeah, I, was, I was just gonna pick up in agreement with fellow panelists that um, the, the, the role of showcasing innovations um, can take you so far, mm -hmm. compendia of, mm -hmm. of I individual uh, innovations. But I think there's, you know, we've had many, we have many reports which say here are a set of innovations. And the, the, the theory of change seems to be, well, if you try <coughs> this, it might work in your context. And I think there's quite a need for uh, digging in and trying to understand why is it that particular powerful innovations do seem to work in their context and, that, and the transferability issue. In other words, to combine the sort of freshness of particular examples with quite a profound analytical exercise of trying to understand whether they work and then combine that with the provision, I heard that this morning, of guides and tools mm -hmm. to help people innovate for themselves. So I see alongside that sort of showcasing role and the sort of convening role, uh, the role of trying to understand and of providing got it. tools da and guides. David, we, we, got, we got the title innovation community, I think. Is there such a thing as an innovation community? Well, I, th I think that's quite, uh, you know, thinking of how we understand educational okay. change to be, I think it's worth problem problematizing that. At a global level, my sense is that there's more evidence of a kind of global innovation community than there was 10 years ago. That's my sense, uh, but you know, that's a rather intangible thing. That's helpful, but I'm not sure that's where it's, the real action is. I think we understand that it's that kind of meso level between the micro and the, and the system-wide level where really the action's going on. We a lot of talk about ecosystems, not ecosystem, but ecosystems, and once you start talking about ecosystems, we're straight away into networks, into communities of practice, into interlocking, dense interlocking ecosystems. Well, once you're doing that, then it seems to me that, the, yes, there may be a community, mm -hmm. but we're really talking about communities in the plural. And that, that also alters our understanding of scale, which people have talked also quite a lot about, because then it's not one scale. There's not going to scale mean going to... A, a whole country. We're talking about how dense those ecosystems are and how sustainable they are. And that is a very different understanding of scale, I think, than a sort of can you scale up to, a, to Finland or to Brazil or wherever it might be. Agreed. Anybody else on that one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would like to say, basically, I think there's a lot of innovators, but I don't think there's a community yet, mm -hmm. or, or there's a very weak community. And I say this based on a study we're doing right now in SUMA, in eight countries simultaneously, uh, with different partners in the region. Uh, and basically what we're seeing is that there's uh, basically two paradigms in this. Of course, you can go for the Schumpeterian way of, of thinking of many Steve Jobs being very innovators, but the other thing is about ecosystem, and you were mentioning the ecosystem. And when you look at the ecosystems in Latin America, they're very weak. Hmm. I mean, it's basically, you have very weak institutional frameworks, 
it's not too many too much resources uh, uh, being given to education uh, not too much interaction between actors somebody would say uh, that a weak ecosystem is a good thing for innovation uh, i would say not and okay. and and i've seen it uh, uh, actually work in the case of let me tell you about chile mm -hmm. in, in 2016 uh, we did a study in which we saw that there was very weak ecosystem there were mm -hmm. no formation of researchers, mm -hmm. teachers were not, neither producers nor users of information, et cetera. And, and Chile took a, a, a step, I was uh, uh, lucky to be involved in, in the design of those programs. We created centers of innovation, which created uh, critical masses. We created Becas Chile, mm -hmm. which promoted the, the, the formation of a lot of, of we, we designed a, um, a tax credit okay. for innovation. When we did that, and you look what happened 10 years afterwards, the country is totally different in terms of the capacity of not only production of innovations and knowledge, but especially in the impact on social policies. Uh, it's an, another situation. So, so I think s stronger ecosystems do actually produce more evidence and more innovation, and we can see in a very specific case. Gina, can I ask you to follow up and plus add the issue of health? Of course. Okay, sure. and of how course, do you see yeah. health? and innovation there sure. in terms of community, of course. Of course, yeah. So I definitely think there's a strong, obviously there's a strong community of innovators. Brookings, uh, thanks to you for bringing together this community. There's also a strong health community of innovators. I think one of the big problems is that the communities of innovators, both in the health sector and the education sector, aren't always talking systematically with communities of government implementers who are managing large systems and ideally trying to reform those systems. And I think they're, a strong ecosystem would bring those two communities together in a more systematic way. Yes, of course, so that the, the government implementers can be inspired by all the things that are going on here and think about what might be the um, school system of the future, how could they leapfrog, um, but also the reverse. I think it's important for implementers to hear from people that are either working to reform or are too tired to even try to reform anymore, um, what the big challenges are, what the barriers are, what the problems that are needed need to be solved, and also to help, help the innovators think about what kinds of institutional environments you need in order to be able to make mm -hmm. the innovation sticky and scalable in that system. Because sometimes there's a lot of very non-sexy type of institutional reforms that are required if you want to introduce the innovation into the system and have it, have it adapt into that system and be scaled. So I think that's, that's actually a challenge in both health and education to get those um, communities. Clear. I will just note that um, we've been looking to try to create a, um, a, a bre better e ecosystem between those two and have been working with the World Bank on that a bit. So, That's, great. Yeah. That's great. We might not be an ecosystem yet, but I think that uh, we've managed to put the issue on the agenda, at least in Brazil mm -hmm. and everywhere where I'm going, there they are many, many people talking about innovations in education nowadays. And, and uh, so, sorry, but how do you balance in Brazil? How do you balance this complexity that Gina is talking about? I mean, uh -huh. doing public policy in education or health, it's so very difficult. That's what I was trying to... Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we uh, actually, in, in Brazil, we are collaborating a lot. I mean, the, the federal government and uh, state and local governments with nonprofits and uh, startups as well, trying to create solutions uh, in a more collaborative way. Mm -hmm. So each one uh, uh, supporting the initiative in a, uh, with the different expertise or different resources or knowledge. And it's been quite interesting to see things really growing up and uh, especially being implemented, which is the main challenge, I think, mm -hmm. because you know having good ideas and drawing beautiful plans, uh, this is uh, a lot easier. But making things uh, really work in, in the field is uh, a lot harder. And because of these collaborations, we are managing to, uh, to progress in some, uh, in some initiatives. Let, let's take 100 for a moment. So you spot innovations, okay? You define innovation already with three criteria. I thought were great. Then what you do? That is to say, when somebody from the government comes to you and say, look, you know, I want to replicate what you're saying that is working here, what do you do? Uh, well, well, first of all, I think that, that anybody, li like the database of Brookings, Brilliant, and there's a lot of innovations for there. So it's not a problem that we don't know about the innovations. Mm -hmm. The problem is how to really make them spread, and it's a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. So first of all, what we do is that we identify, we are empowering the teachers. Then we package them in a beautiful way so that anybody can understand. 
Then we are promoting them in events with videos and, and so on. Then we are having innovation summit in Finland. Then we are having ambassadors in 50 countries at the moment to promote those. Then we are creating media weekly and so mm -hmm. on. And that's only the very beginning because then the work starts. And I think that if you are, if you are trying to understand the, the education ecosystem or industry, uh, I think that each and everyone, I'm going to events in, in 20, 30 countries and the debate is always the same, which means that we need to have breadth of skills, six Cs, four Cs and so on. No one disagrees. And then there are a lot of innovations that can actually solve the problems. So we know what the problems are and we have the solutions but something is lacking in between. And I think that it's fundamentally, it's a sales pro problem. It's a distribution problem. It's an agent problem, which means that we think that education innovations would scale magically. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen in any industry. We need to have someone who knows what other countries want, know the prop kind of like know who's the forerunner, who's more traditional, what are they looking, then they are promoting, then they are selling, then they are helping in implementation, then they are helping in funding, and so on and so on. And that's something that is lacking from the education. And I think that within five, ten years, there's going to be a lot of companies, a lot of organizations, a lot of, a lot of agents that are doing hard work in promoting innovations and also helping in implementation. And we want to be that as well. So would say that innovation is first global and then local? Uh, I, I would say that, that at the moment, when you're asking whether we have a global education community, of course, everything is relative. But I'd say that compared to many other industries, I'd say it's almost non-existent. Interesting. Thank you. So it's 4.30 already, past 4.30. We're going to open the mic for questions. Uh, we have plenty of questions, so we're going to take all of them, uh, make them, uh, identify yourself, and make them relatively short so we can pack as many as possible. So I don't know who has the mic but there's a lot of, you just decide to whom you give the mic. There you go. Uh, thank you and thank Brookings for the conference. Uh, very inspirational in many ways. Uh, I'm Steve Cleese from the University of Maryland. Um, and my question is, uh, how can we separate the talk of innovation and leapfrogging from the discussion of the awful conditions hmm in so many of our schools around the world, uh, with poor teacher salaries, with huge class sizes, with little teacher training, with teacher status so low, uh, and, and no discussion of the resources needed to do something about that. We, we do a decent job of educating advantaged students around the world, but the adversity and poverty facing poor children. I don't see how we can talk about innovation and leapfrogging without talking about the transformation needed to get everybody up to some level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've been, yeah, I've been debating with myself many times whether we're wasting our time talking about innovation and education. I don't think so, but I'm going to let my panelists here uh, answer that question or at least debate it. Who wants to take it? Okay, I have two takers, three takers, four takers. So... Let's start from the left to the right. Again, no ideological preference. You, your time will come for sure. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, that's a essential question. And, and I think that interestingly, when discussing with teachers in every country, I'd say most of the teachers actually hate the word innovation. They are not mm. excited, but they hate. Because they have a feeling that it's messing up the system. It doesn't really work. It's for profit. It's odd. It's digital and so on and so on, which it isn't. So I'd say that the word innovation has a image problem and for a good reason in education, and we have to fix that one. Okay. And, and I think that in order to make innovation spread, we have to listen to teachers, we have to understand the struggle, we have to educate them, we have to give them resources, we have to follow the process together with them, and that's not something that is happening. So I think that if we are messing up the system with new, new innovations or whatever, we, it's gonna be extremely harmful. So I'd say that, that that's kind of like one of the key things in here which I'm worried. But then again, we have to understand is that like Rebecca was saying in the morning, the best innovations are not extra work. They are helping teachers mm -hmm. and, and so on. So we have to understand that as well. Mm -hmm. Got it. Anybody else? One yeah, more. Yeah, I was just gonna say that, that I mean, certainly the innovations that we looked at as through the um, 
innovative learning environments project, several of those were precisely innovations because the adversity was so extreme. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you had to innovate. Yeah. You couldn't go on doing what you were doing before. So you made Javier points here. Uh, sorry? You made Javier's point. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so that, I mean, I think that's one thing. But I do think that it's also extremely important not to, this whole question of borrowing and transfer and so on, that you don't take a model that works in a leafy suburb of a rich society and think that that's going to work all over the world. So I, I agree entirely that uh, the context, the conditions, and so on are really important, okay. but not to counterpose innovation with adversity. OK, you're going to take another question from the audience. Um, my name is Catherine Adams from LIDE. And uh, my question is related to a word that keeps coming up, and that is e ecosystems that foster innovation. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if the panel could speak about what they're observing are the conditions that create that ecosystem, that allow us to foster innovation so that more people become innovators. Hmm. Gina. Well, you asked me before about the health sector. Maybe I can give an example from health, if you'll permit me, that maybe might be um, helpful sure. here. So I think in, there's a lot of innovators in health that are focused on you know, sort of new technologies, use of mobile, et cetera. But we've also focused in health on how you can make people that are actually running systems, government practitioners, into innovators themselves to solve some of those systemic issues that our, our first questioner um, mentioned. And we created about eight years ago something called the Joint Learning Network for Universal Health Coverage, which started, uh, founded by six countries and their governments, uh, supported by, by our organization, the World Bank, and a number of other partners. And what it does is it brings together people from those, those countries, true practitioners that are facing common challenges across countries, and they identify the problem they're trying to solve, and they work together to develop solutions to that problem. And then they take them back and they adapt them in their own context uh, and implement them. And then in the process, they actually create global public goods um, around how to think about those problems that can be used by others. And now that network has grown to 30 countries. Um, currently, there are 13 different technical collaboratives going on with different mixes of countries working on each. But it's really making um, those government leaders into innovators. And we've been trying to think about, is there a way we could uh, create something similar um, for ministries of education, maybe with starting in the continent of Africa with some other uh, countries weighing in? And, and one thing I'd like to solve when we do this in education is what I mentioned earlier. I think we didn't, in the health network, do enough to bring together the innovators and the policymakers to solve those problems. I think if we did this in education, ideally, we would create these sorts of collaboratives to focus on problems, and it would engage both So you would start government. from problems to solutions? Yes. That's the way you think that's, that it should that's be That's one way, because I don't think all innovations, sometimes we think of innovations as nifty new products yes. or tools or technologies, but sometimes you need an innovative way to solve the problem of, you know, ghost workers in the system. How did, how did a country figure out how to get rid of ghost workers so that right. they could then save those resources to spend on, on kids? And I saw you yeah. ascending, so go you ahead, know, please. But in order to really foster innovations, we have to change mindsets, culture, beliefs, and that's not easy. It's not about uh, trying to uh, stimulate them to change small things that they are doing, but change completely. Uh -huh. And uh, so uh, what we realize is that we really have to uh, create an opportunity for the, uh, the beneficiaries mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. for instance, students, teachers, parents, to participate in the transformation process. So it's not that they are not going to use uh, references, uh, innovations that have been tested all over, but th those might, uh, have, has, uh, have to be like uh, the raw material that they are going to work with. But that we have to embed, to inoculate the virus of innovation <laughs> inside the system so they can really uh, recognize their problems and okay. find solutions and use all these information to really change things in a bit more contextualized way. That's very way. provocative. And I want to ask you about Brazil and other countries in Latin America in which when you ask people if they're happy with the education their kids are receiving, they would say yes. Uh -huh. When they have to assess the entire system, they say there's a disaster. Okay. Yeah. How, so but how do parents you say that uh, they are happy with the education yes. that uh, the so children are receiving? But when you ask students 
they would give you another very different opinion, hmm. uh, another version of the problem. Uh, so what happened is that we have actually to educate people so they can understand what good education is about in this century. Great. You know, they, they still have a different perspective on what a good education is. And we really have to educate, and students, they know better. Thank you, Anna. I'm going to take uh, two more questions, or three more questions, or four more questions. I'm not sure. Uh, so why do we do something? Why don't we give, once you have the mic, then pass it on to the next one so we can do it quickly, okay? okay Go ahead. Sounds good. Uh, Armin Doucette, I'm a teacher in Canada on the mm -hmm. East Coast. Uh, I'm finding the debate today very interesting. There's one thing that I'm not hearing a lot about. I, I believe that teachers do want to innovate, especially, specifically to facilitate their job. What I'm not hearing is how are we going to align the mission and vision from top, top end policy to give us the liberty to actually do that. Mm -hmm. There's no teacher that walks into the classroom and says, I don't want to reach every kid today. So if you look at the United States, the reality is standardized testing is hovering over all classrooms. So to innovate, you're taking some risk. And when there's socioeconomic risks and your job's at risk, then you know what? I got to bring food at the table. So when are we going to actually have real talks about policy within a society, within a country that has a taxation system that would have health care, mental health, social working, so that we would actually get that out of the classroom in some ways to help teachers? That's what I'm not hearing today, which is very scary because I do believe that teachers do innovate in the classroom. So that's my question. So I'm going to paraphrase you a little bit, so you're going to forgive me. Uh, it's very difficult to innovate unless you change radically the rules of society. Is that a good, I, I don't know if it's a good paraphrasing, but let me, let me try that one on the panel. Um, Javier. Yeah, um, I mean, I totally agree on, on the fact that the, the issue of enabling conditions. Um, let's take one example. And uh, when you look at the most effective, uh, or one of the most effective practices has to do with feedback. In order to do properly feedback, you, you need non-lecturing time. So, uh, so you, you need that enabling condition. That sense that, that that's actually a regulation, of course. Uh, but also, you need resources. And, and, and going back, maybe also uh, linking it to another question that has to do with, indeed, uh, the fact that the, the funding is so low that actually hinders innovation. So let, let's talk about Latin America just for a second. Uh, in the OECD, we're spending uh, $9,000 uh, uh, per child per year. In, in Latin America, it's around $3,000. Uh, and we know there's a relationship between resources and quality until up to uh, more or less $8,000. Emiliana Vegas, who's sitting here, has done a study on that. And, and many others have, have actually uh, uh, seen that in a consistent way. So we know that, that uh, resources are, are scarce. Two, mm -hmm. not, they're not only they're low, but actually we're diverging with the rest of, 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 of leaders. If we look at, for example, Mexico, Brazil, Chile, we compare how much they were spending in, two, in the year 2000, how much they're spending in 2013, for example, that we did that in SUMA. And what we saw is that uh, we're, there was a gap of $3,000 per ch children per child per year. And now it's more than 5,000. So the point is it's low, it's diverging. And that has a real implication for innovation, uh, as you were saying. Because among other things, uh, that means that a lot of teachers have more than one employment. So through employment in Latin America is a very serious issue right now. Let me it has to do with funding. And therefore, if you have more than one job, of course, you won't be able to f even innovate because you have many contracts. You have to be moving from one job to another. So innovation, and just to finish with that and the institutional part that you were saying, is innovation is, is not separate for, from institutional regulatory innovation okay. or regulatory change. Let me go beyond regulator, regulation and go to testing. Mm -hmm. So is innovation and testing, are, are those two terms mm -hmm. compatible or not? I think I, Anna, I'm going to give you <laughs> the, the first uh, shot at that one. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we believe that actually what uh, moved us was that uh, really trying to change the national curriculum because what is being assessed, what is there that, uh, you, know, you know, what the system says that children have, have to, students have to learn. 
So by changing the curriculum and embedding the 21st century skills in a more innovative approach to what they have to learn, we are now uh, trying to really make a, a more complex changes in the way uh, learning is, is assessed. Mm. But on the other hand, we really have to, uh, how do we say this, qualify the demand for education because at least in my country, Politicians and you know governments, they just uh, uh, work under pressure. Oh, so if society is not pressuring for this different type of education, they will never change. <laughs> Standardized testing, of course. Uh, yeah. Uh, whenever we are improving or developing education, I think that we should always start with the fundament fundamental question, which is what is the purpose of education? Mm -hmm. If you ask from me, it's to help every child flourish in life, no matter what happens. Right. And as we heard today, as we all know, the world will be extremely uncertain, which means that no one knows what works. So then, then the key thing in school is that the question we are hearing again and again and again is that how do we know that this works? Well, with, with many of the things you don't. And then the question, question I'm asking is that, is it a good thing that something doesn't work? because that's exactly the world we are moving into. So for example, in Finland, I'd say that the essence of Finnish education system with the teachers is consisting of two things. We love our teachers, we give them freedom, we trust them. And then we are saying is that, please do test new things. And if some of the things don't work, it's great because we are learning. Mm -hmm. And I think that that should, be the essence, that, that should be the essence of education in every country if we want to be pre preparing our kids for the future. Thank you very much. I'm going to take another question. Go ahead. There's a microphone there and a microphone here. So we're going to go with that first and then the second. Go ahead. Natalia Gavrilica from the uh, Global Innovation Fund. Um, I want to complicate matters a little bit more. Why not? We've, we've so heard a lot about... about so we're going to we're going <laughs> to quickly. <laughs> we've heard about um, sort of innovations and the role of innovations in yeah. unburdening teachers and helping them deliver, but in countries with very low state capacity, you, there are plenty of bureaucrats who um, also need to be unburdened. So, um, and, and, and uh, in, in, the, in these countries, the real question is uh, last mile service delivery yeah. or implementation. And so where are the innovations that are helping unburden those bureaucrats? So let's say, you know, are we innovating on procurement? Are we innovating on monitoring systems and easy to use dashboards for people who are sort of constantly hearing about innovations that they have to scale up and the challenges that they have to solve and um, quality assurance tools. So how many innovations are thinking about, you know, once the scales, how are we going to know that the impact is um, being maintained because we have uh, good that's quality a, assurance tools. That's a great question. Thank you for complicating things. I think that that's a great complication mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to have. The second mic was here, so we're going to take two. Go ahead. Yes, hello. My, my name is Alejandro Lara, and uh, Marcelo, I don't know if you remember me. I actually, in, in the past, I challenged at the IDB the chess master uh, live. So uh, right now I'm going to challenge the panel, uh, and especially uh, uh, the person sitting on the right. Uh, don't, sorry, don't remember your name. Um, Right now, we created a startup, a nonprofit, uh, from the brain sciences. We're providing the behavioral approach of in, the, uh, in early intervention strategies in, in, uh, in developing countries. That's the whole rationale. So when you deal with behavioral change, and you mentioned something related to that, it takes time, right, to see results. So my question to you specifically, and of course, I would like to hear the view of the panel, if our nonprofit is going to work in the future. Um, it's how much, what is the, the reasonable and feasible time for a, a nonprofit to, to, to show results? I mean, remember that we need to build credibility, which is a big thing, right? And we need to find proje related projects to prove ourselves that, that, that this project is going to work. So what is the reasonable time? I mean, what is the, you know, what, what do you think is a, is a good time to, a good to, to see those things at work and also hear your view? Thank you. Okay, this is the story. Where's Emma? Emma Naslund. Is it here? Okay. Emma put me, I think it was last year, I don't remember, but I think it was last year, to play against a grandmaster, a chess grandmaster. 
okay, on stage. Uh, he was blindfolded, okay, and he won in like 15 moves <laughs> against me, okay. But this guy here helped me to get to the 15th move, okay. Otherwise, it would have been five, according to what they tell me. Thank you very much, by the way. So we have two questions. That was the story. Uh, two questions. The first one is the last mile innovations and implementation. The second one is for non for profit, and probably there's many for non for profits here. When is the right time to show off what they do and to ripe and go to mature with their products? So, I think it can take, just to take the second question, I think it can take a little while to get to the point where you can really show that something works. And just to give an example, um, our adaptive learning team has been working with a number of different innovators. We've worked with World Reader in India on their Read to Kids program, which um, basically makes for free available an, an app that uh, parents can download lots of different books mm -hmm. and read with their kids. Um, seems very simple, right? But there's been a lot of testing that we've been supporting them on to figure out what are the right behavior change messages and channels in order to get parents to actually take up and start reading with their children. And we just got the first set of results back. After doing a lot of this rapid testing, the first set of results was took two years to get. We had 200,000 families interact, interact with the application, and about 7,000 actually started using it regularly. Okay. So it's a question, is that a success? Is that a failure? It's 7,000 more kids that are getting read to on a regular basis. There's also a lot that didn't take it up. So there's still a lot more to learn. And so I think that's the way we've been thinking about this. How can we help them continue to learn how to take that 7,000 and make it into 50,000 next time? And, and I hope that's the way you and many other innovators will think about this. It's not about proving that it works and then flipping a switch, but mm -hmm. over time, figuring out how to improve um, your, your implementation, your product, your, your design, so that it will be more impactful. That's, so, that's why it's so important, partnerships and funding. Funding, funding long term or medium term, mm -hmm. so you don't have to do it tomorrow. And partnerships, because you need to create credibility with your product as well. You cannot do it by yourself. It's very difficult to do it. That would be my advice, but go ahead, uh, Sam. Briefly to the first question, I, I, I think that um, we need to have innovations in every level of the system. We need to have classroom innovations, but also management, leadership innovations, mm -hmm. systematic innovations, last mile innovations, mm -hmm. and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. So we should be discussing about all of this. Everything. Then going back to your question, which is a great question, because I've been having my own companies 30 years. I've been innovating, creating concepts, creating companies and so on. So the key question is, when do you know what is the right time to stop? Should you continue or stop? Mm. And that's, that's complicated. But, but my, my gut feeling in here is, many of you might disagree, but, but I have a feeling is that you kind of like sense almost from day one is that there's something great. It starts to gain traction. It's growing. It's not simple. But you have a feeling is that we are going to place the places. If it's a struggle, if it's uphill day after day after day, most likely there's something wrong. Okay. Then and then that's pivoting, which, which means that then you change, 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 and then you get the feeling is that wow, now it's going. So I'd say that if for the past six months, if it's been struggle, most likely there is something wrong. So it's intuition be, and pivoting. Exactly. All right. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right, what I'm going to do now, because I have, so I'm going to take very quick questions, 100 words, and very quick answer, 100 words. <laughs> so we're going to take all the questions that we have in the room left. Wow. So we have one, two, three, <laughs> so four. Okay. Um, my name is Phil Evans. I'm from the International Baccalaureate, and I want to just sort of piggyback off the ecosystem question for innovation and sort of maybe tailor a little bit more to professional development. Um, in my experience as a teacher, often uh, professional development was very top-down, and we had to sort of mm -hmm. sit through it. Um, and, you know, in the International Baccalaureate, the idea is come to training number one and then implement, collaborate, reflect, improve, then maybe in a couple of years right. come to two. So how do you, how, like what are the elements, particularly in some of the countries where we have a lot of innovation happening, when it comes to professional development, what does it look like and how do we structure that? What are the systematic elements that make that work? Thank you. That's going to take more than 100, but we're going to do our best. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, uh, Daniela Navitarte from the Ministry of Education of Peru. 
maybe to hear from someone different, from the government, the famous bureaucrats uh, <laughs> that deny innovation. So, uh, <laughs> go ahead. Really quick, to go back to a question that you did, Marcelo, and it was an answer the ethical side of trying to innovate with public funds. Mm -hmm. Because innovation, is, if we understand it, trial, error, trial, error, it's okay in private or NGOs, it's their shareholders' money. I agree. What's but the question? Go ahead. What are the, uh, the comments that you can have about the ethical side of trying to innovate okay. with taxpayer money? We're going to press these guys so they, they say that. Okay. Miguel. Uh, my question is a little bit rude. If we had this meeting 20 years ago, instead of innovation, we would, we would be, be discussing younger. technology <laughs> the same way, right? So we are using a dummy, uh, innovation as a dummy. Innovation ah. is a very broad issue. I mean, we use it for everything. I want to understand what problem are we trying to solve and what's the innovation and not the other way around. In right. the past, we discussed technology without saying what technology should solve. Mm -hmm. And now we are doing the same. What are we trying to solve? Because if we want to solve things, we have to do all the way through the innovation. There's no point of Got talking it. on innovation in doing and not in testing. So, Miguel, the question is? The question is, what what's, are we trying to solve? what's your vision on what innovation ah. are we discussing here? General okay. innovation or particular? What's the aim? What's the three more important goals for the next 10 years? Got it. There's somebody behind you that wants to ask a question, and the gentleman there is going to be the last one. Hi, Andrea Pizzaconi, CEO of the Christie Company. We provide affordable financing for education infrastructure at a large scale. I didn't hear any mention, for the most part, of the private sector that does not belong to the NGO sector today. Uh -huh. And yet, they have by far the most money. And my question is, what about the innovations of public-private partnerships? That word is overused, but proper use of private capital to bring solutions to scale in an equitable an ethical way. Super good question. Thank you very much. And last but not least. Thank you for that. Joshua question. Muskin, uh, Geneva Global. Uh, we've been talking a lot about innovation as product, something that we can prove, that we can disseminate. I'm um, going back to our friend from Canada and wondering how do we look at innovation as process? Yes. If we go to the classroom and we give a teacher a beautifully crafted innovation, after they've done it two or three times, the students are getting bored of it. So how do we create, and someone talked about the enabling environment, how do we create the opportunities and give the um, freedom to teachers to innovate as a perpetual process of their pedagogy? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we have a challenge. Five questions, five panelists. <laughs> so how do we solve the problem? Well. If I start, start which, which one are you going to take? Uh, I combine, I combine, combine two. First of all, when we are discussing about innovations, I think we have to separate development, ideas, mm -hmm. creativity, design thinking, innovations, and all are crucial, but they are slightly different. So if I'm th thinking about innovations, what I would do is that I would identify the innovations which are having a lot of momentum and then I would concentrate on helping those spread. Because you cannot force. Independently of the problem? Uh, you, you, can ha you can have private money, you can have public money and so on, but I would concentrate on those. And then the cru really good question of what would be if I would choose one problem to solve using innovations. Mm -hmm. For me it would be how to make the world of education or education innovations global. Because there's a lot of great innovations that don't spread. If we can get the know-how, the knowledge of each and every country and use those, that would be brilliant. So um, I would just say that the, the issue I suppose I would focus on, and what's innovation for especially, I mean you can have innovations about lots of things, would be particularly about engagement. Engagement of learners, engagements of families, engagements of teachers, engagements of um, uh, uh, communities. We have to use shorthands. We use the word innovation. Personally, I'm not terribly sold on it. I would be quite happy to think about powerful teaching and learning mm -hmm. that's effective, mm -hmm. that's equitable, and that's efficient. I mean, I, and if I didn't use the word innovation, it wouldn't keep me up at night. Uh, but I think, I think it's engagement especially, I think, because once you have engagement, then all sorts of other things can happen. Who wants to take the one in the private sector and, and mm -hmm. education? 
I can't you know, if no I one mean else that, wants to. I know <laughs> health, I I know health uh, travels very well there, sure. no? Yes. Yeah, so um, clearly there's a role for private capital in, in funding innovation, um, but I think there is a risk sometimes. This certainly happens in health where people feel like the, there's going to be something like innovative financing that will come in and solve all the problems of the gaps in public sector funding because money will miraculously appear because private organizations will put it in. Well, the reality is private organizations often want to make money and there needs to be a revenue stream to support them and often that revenue stream is coming okay. from government ultimately because governments are the ones buying the innovation from the private sector. So it's great to have capital investment to help um, develop innovations um, but ultimately there's someone that has to pay and when we're talking about school kids around the world who are getting public education it's usually governments that pay so i think they we have to balance the notion of how much the, there's a, a panacea with uh with pub, with a private financing okay thank you very much Gina. Uh, that that's for another conference all, all together <laughs> exactly. uh, and I, i'm super interested in you at least trying to tackle the ethical conversation the i don't know if i'm putting conversation. you in a difficult spot i wow. hope not I'll, I'll use an example for that. So the Municipal Department of Education, the city of Sao Paulo, mm -hmm. they created a, 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 an education lab uh, and they invite people from very different sectors, private sector, startups, uh, teachers, whoever wants to collaborate. They, they pick the, the problems that really hurt them the most, the m most painful problems, and they create this environment where those people can create solutions together. And, uh, and then uh, the uh, commitment of the Department of Education is to implement it in a way that uh, they can really follow up on the uh, evidences that it's working and uh, support the improvement of the solution. So it's not only about investing a lot of money in buying things, but uh, actually creating a space for, the, for sometimes even without money allowing the, uh, the innovations to happen. But of course, they, they are very clear on the problems that they want to solve. Okay. And problems related to inequalities, relevance. Those are the two main priorities nowadays in Brazil. So what you're saying is that there's an ethical place for the government? To, to convene, to, to convene, convene all these people to okay. uh, you know, it, try to innovate together. It's not only about buying things. And risk appetite should be there too? The Sorry? risk, the risk that that entails. But it's uh, it's uh, the risk is shared okay. with uh, uh, lots of stakeholders. You know, it's not only uh, in in the government responsibility to make it happen. Thank or you, Anna. Work. That's very good. Yes, um, maybe tackling uh, s some of the questions regarding the private sector. I think it, the private sector does have a, a role, <coughs> but the point is where and when. Uh, and 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 I think mm -hmm. there is a distinction between uncertainty and risk. Uh, the private sector won't go where there's uncertainty. And that's where it's so important, especially in social areas such as education, the role of the state, because the private sector won't go there. It will go where, where there's risk. And, and, and even there, we will have to have some kind of funding to, to promote that. Okay. So that's one. Okay. Regarding Daniel's question on, on ethical, uh, how do we make this ethical? I think it has to do with how do we create this in a, a systematic process of innovation within the government. And I know, of course, you've been involved on in that. And I, and I guess how do you institutionalize the process of innovation in a very clear way of how do you test, how do you scale, et cetera. And, and, and a very good example is actually the Minu Lab in, in, in Peru. So you make it, the, the, I, I didn't understand, you have to make it clear what you're trying to achieve? That's what you, you have to have a, a, a very well thought process on how you innovate from the public sector. It mm -hmm. cannot just be any idea. And we see this in the region. Sometimes leaders have very creative ideas and, not, and sometimes they're wrong ideas. So the, 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 the thing is, how do you create a, a more, uh, let's say, a clear uh, process based in criteria? Okay, let me push you a little bit further. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you said the wrong ideas. Yes. Who's to say that it's a wrong idea? That's okay. Let me go to the. It's a little bit tricky, yeah, yeah. I don't know. So the, the point is basically is where you start. I just had a conversation mm -hmm. two weeks ago with a minister of education mm -hmm. in the region, and, mm -hmm. and he was saying we want to promote innovation. Yes. And what I said is let's start then from where we know it's working. Okay. So if the, let's say not the wrong idea, it's it's basically the most uncertain ideas. Okay. Uh, you could you should start from an ethical perspective using your resources where there's a lot of certainty that those things will work. 
So for example, the platform of effective practice that we have been working with EF is a good place to start because you know those practices actually have, are working based on evidence, based on the, the last 10 years of research in the exactly. world. So an ethical way of starting innovation is not only having an institutionalized process of how you do this in a very kind of objective way, but also where you start from and how do you institutionalize it through a Mineo lab or center of innovation in the Ministry of Education in Chile, et cetera. Right. Okay, and, and to finalize the question of which would be the most important Miguel's question, I would say just one thing in Latin America, at least in my perspective, is diversity. How do you integrate diversity? I think that's a challenge, most important challenge for the next 30 years, is how do you integrate migrants, social classes, um, sexual diversity, et cetera, et cetera. I think in Latin America, we're, we're very lagging behind in how do we understand the other, that those other that are different from ourselves. Okay. I need to finalize this, and I have to do two things. I have to do the announcement. Which if I don't do this, I don't, uh, I don't get paid today. <laughs> so, but you have to promise me that before we do that, uh, we recognize uh, our panelists. They've been great sports. Uh, I, I promise that you would, I would interrupt you. I didn't interrupt you that much, but a little <laughs> bit. And I, uh, I think that uh, you've been great, and, and I want to thank you all of you and all the great audience that we have. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.